We're living in the midst of a season of heated debates about a fundamental idea, the idea of freedom, of personal liberty. Even as I say those words, there are demonstrations in the streets of cities protesting the restrictions on our lives imposed by governments trying to gain the upper hand on the ravages of the pandemic. And we've seen countless stories of people refusing to wear masks in all kinds of situations, arguing that doing so infringes their liberties. Of course, all of those protests are happening in places where individual liberties are a cornerstone of how government works. And it's not an accident that all of those places are places deeply influenced by the inheritance of Christian ideas. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Just mentioning the fact of these protests might raise your own anxiety level a little. So let me instead begin in another deeply divided community, Paul's little unhappy church in Corinth. You don't have to read very far into his letter to the Corinthians to know that a lot of what Paul is trying to do is keep a church together that is falling apart. He has an investment in this. He started the church. And because Paul started that church, we know that basically it had two kinds of people in it. People who were part of the Jewish community in the town of Corinth, and people who came from basically every other tradition in the Roman Empire. People that the Jewish community would have called goyim, people of other nations, the Gentiles. In the ancient world, that divide was a very deep one. It wasn't just about the dietary laws that the Jewish people followed. Jewish people wouldn't eat food prepared by people who weren't Jews. They typically wouldn't even eat in homes that were the households of Gentiles. Paul was great at bringing people together across this difference. But once he left town and went on to another town to plant another church, the old differences tended to divide people again. That's the problem he's addressing in the reading we heard this morning. Some people in the community are Gentiles. In the world they come from, the strict rules about foods that are clean and unclean don't apply. And here's something more. It was pretty common for folks in that experience that a friend of yours might invite you to dinner, a dinner that was held in a particular part of a local temple dedicated to a favorite god. Aphrodite had a big temple in Corinth, so did Apollos. When you went to that banquet, the first thing that would happen would be a little bit of the meal would be set aside in a short ceremony for the local god. But you didn't really mind that because the people who had invited you were your friends, and you made business contacts there. Or maybe you might meet a person who could become a new mate. If you were Jewish, that whole world was close to you. It wasn't just about the food rules. It was about the first two commandments. You only give worship to the God of the covenant, the God of Abraham. And you don't give your worship to idols. Not ever. The markets of Corinth were the places where you'd go to buy supplies for such a banquet. But the Jewish folks had their own markets because they didn't even want to buy their food from the same markets that supplied the banquets that would be the meat for the temple and the sacrifice to the idols. That's the life of Corinth. Some people are free to go to the market to buy what's there, to eat it at home, or to join in a dinner at the local temple with their friends. And some people are not. And Paul has planted a church with both communities in it, a church that has at the center of its life sharing a meal in common. How on earth can they stay together? That's a long ago story. Why does any of this matter to us? 
Because what Paul writes to them isn't really about food or what to eat or what not to eat. What Paul is writing to them is about the relationship between the liberty each of us has and the responsibility Christians have toward others, all others. That's where the ancient becomes very modern. Some of the people in this community were free to eat whatever they pleased. They were free to join their friends for banquets in the temples. But Paul is telling them that their exercise of that freedom is not cost-free. When they do what they're free to do, they can harm others, in this case, by the force of their example. To someone who doesn't know them, who doesn't know that they're part of the Christian community, it sure does look that what they're doing is worshiping idols in the temple. Paul was calling those early Christians to account for how they used their freedoms. And in doing so, he was setting in place a fundamental idea in Christian ethics. When we call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ, we give up the looking out for number one rule of life. We accept that what we do, the choices we make, have consequences for others. And we accept that we are responsible not only to ourselves, but for the consequences of our actions for others as well. Our year of pandemic has revealed to us in unsettling ways that without even knowing it, we were living alongside a foreign country, the Republic of Cain. The Republic of Cain is a place where no one is their brother's keeper, where everyone denies any responsibility toward anyone other than themselves. The creed of that republic is rugged individualism. The prophets of that republic are as varied as Ayn Rand and Friedrich Nietzsche. Whatever else this pandemic has taught us, it has taught us what happens when human beings are suddenly confronted with the crisis of responsibility, the reality that they might be dangerous to others simply by exercising what seems like harmless liberties. You can be infected with this virus and never know it, feel as though you are healthy, and you can give someone else a disease that might kill them. There are people around us who reject the idea that this fact should impose upon them any obligation to change their behavior or somehow limit their liberties. And let me say this directly, that is a profoundly unchristian, even an anti-Christian idea. If we are disciples, caring for the welfare of others is not optional for us, it is obligatory. Voluntarily accepting limits on our liberties for the good of others is what Christ-like love looks like. It's how the transformative power of God's love actually gets the transforming done. It's how unjust systems are dismantled, how oppression is turned into compassion, how racism is turned into reconciliation. We should be in no doubt that we are living in an era where basic ideas we took for granted, ideas like compassion and caring for the vulnerable and caring for the society that we must make together, those ideas are suddenly being contended. What it means now for us to be people of the epiphany is to be people shedding light, the light of Christ's love through the example of our lives showing that we accept our responsibilities toward the least, the last, and the lost, and that we do so fearlessly. We do that here in the cathedral twice a week by feeding the hungry and the neglected. We do that in Rome at the Refugee Center and in Frankfurt with the Heimkara Ministry and the missions of our church that work with refugee communities. This isn't just about wearing masks. For us, for the months and years ahead, it's about whether we accept the responsibilities that come with discipleship and remember 
what we've been taught, that when we serve others in the name of Christ, we serve Christ, and that serving Christ is perfect freedom. Amen.